Good evening. We're so glad that you have gathered with us tonight. Special welcome to those of you who are joining us online to remember and commemorate the death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's on this night as we enter into Easter weekend that we remember what he gave on our behalf. And I don't know if you ever feel this way, but sometimes for me, from one year to the next, one week to the next, I find myself thinking, like, yeah, Jesus died. Yep, I know that. He did that. He did that for me, and I am eternally grateful. But then there are these moments where it, like, really hits, and it really sinks in of what he did for us. One of the things that uh, I have been doing this year, specifically starting in the season of Lent, as I've been watching the show, The Chosen. Anybody here been watching it? Fantastic show. And I have been so taken by the person of Jesus in that show. Whoever did the casting for that show did an amazing job, specifically with Jesus. I have found myself thinking like, he is amazing. And I hope that when I meet Jesus, he is like that. And then I find myself thinking, but you know what? He's probably better than that. (laughs) And so after the first few episodes, I just found myself thinking about Jesus and that person and the way that he would interact with people, the way that he would interact with kids, the things that he would do. And I just found, I didn't know how to explain it any other way. I was telling a friend this and I said, I think I'm smitten with Jesus. I think I've grown smitten with him. And I share all that because as we enter into Good Friday, it's given me more of an emotional attachment to Jesus in a way where I reflect on his death. I think about the emotional attachment and the relationship and the friendship that the disciples would have with him. And if you've ever lost a good friend or a loved one who you have a tight emotional attachment to you, you know the grief of that. And so Good Friday is a day when we remember the grief that accompanies the loss of Jesus' life. And and while we know the end of the story, it's also good to pause and remember what exactly he gave for us. And so tonight what we're going to do is we're going to enter into Luke 23, which is the story of Jesus' crucifixion from Luke's gospel. And specifically, we're going to have three reflections over the course of the evening that center around three things that Jesus says while he is nailed to the cross. And then before we're done, we're going to go before the Lord's table to remember his sacrifice through the meal that he gave us as we enter into this holy weekend. And this is how the story, at least where we're going to pick it up, begins. This is Luke 23, starting in verse 26. It says, As the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. And a large number of people followed him. And so Jesus, at this point in the story, is on his way to to his death, having somebody else carry his cross because he is too beaten and battered to do it himself. And there is a mob of people following him. Let's pray. Lord, we ask as we enter into this evening that our hearts would be open to remember afresh the immensity of your love for us through what you gave through your son on the cross. I pray this in your name. Amen. Continuing in Luke chapter 23. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. 
and they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. It's about a week before I returned back to college for my junior year. And I was just wrapping up work and saying goodbye to all my friends. And as I was, I was leaving for the day, I noticed a new sign on the staff room wall. And it said, welcome back, Emily, our new general manager. Instantly, just my gut starts to ache. Just frustration building. See, I didn't like Emily. I worked with her. Didn't like what she did. Didn't like the way she ran things. But I wasn't mad for myself. I was leaving. I was getting out of Dodge. I was mad for everybody else. So over the next week, I got to hear those frustrations of everybody. You know, those words of encouragement. Chris, you're so lucky you're getting out of here. I wish I was going with you. You're leaving at just the right time. And so then on my last day, I was like, you know what? Somebody needs to know. So I took it upon myself. And I was like, it's my last day. I'm going to leave a note too. So I left a note right next to the announcement. And I signed that note. Thank God I'm leaving. There's something about stress and closure that make us do things that we wouldn't normally do. That bring out some of that piece of our nature that we don't want brought out. That wasn't necessarily my finest hour. And in Jesus, we see in this moment a man tied to a cross. Stress seeping through. Pain and anguish, a time of closure. He knows his death is near. And we start to see his true nature come to life. But he doesn't respond like I did. He doesn't respond in words and ridicule and retribution towards the people who have put him on that cross. No. He responds in a way that only Jesus can. And he says, Father, forgive them. He calls back to this idea that he's placed forth just a few days before. He had a scribe approach him, and the scribe says, Teacher, it's the greatest commandment. Jesus' response? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. Oh, and the second? It's, it's similar. Love your neighbor as yourself. And in this moment, on the cross, Jesus shows us who those neighbors are that we're to love. Because it's really easy sometimes to love, you know, that person who, you know, they get in front of you in the checkout line, but they only have one box, one box. So you're like, ah, I, can, I can let that go. Eh, forgive them. But what about that person who cut you off? Right? What about the person who called you names? What about the person who put up a sign on the staff room wall? that said, thank God I'm leaving. <laughs> right? Jesus' obedience on the cross is an act of love, and it's an act of submission. And it calls back to Isaiah's prophecy in Isaiah 53, where he says, he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. He prayed for them. 
He acted out for them. His cry of forgiveness bears the ultimate love of a neighbor. He intercedes for everyone, for even those people who plotted against him for his death, the people who are crying out in ridicule in front of him. He cries out for them, Father, forgive them. Because see, there's nothing, nothing we can do to Jesus, to each other, that makes it so we can't be forgiven. For the rest of us, the promise of that great commandment, the promise of forgiveness sits on us as well. And as we sit here today and we focus on Christ's death and his time on the cross, we have to ask ourselves, is there anybody in our lives that we're not allowing to have hope and forgiveness because we won't forgive them? Because a lot of change happens when we're forgiven, right? When we feel forgiveness, it adjusts the way we look at people. That same job I left, the one where I put the notice on the wall, guess who had to show up two years later with an application? <laughs> and I went through the interview process and everything was going great. And they looked at me and said, yeah, Chris, we really want to bring you on. Um, but there's one person we have to talk to first, and we'll get back to you. Emily. A week later, I started. And started a 20-year career. But that forgiveness, that time that she spent, and that willingness that she had to overlook and to allow me the space to say, I'm sorry, change the entire path of my life. Christ's forgiveness does that to each one of us. And when we allow ourselves to be a beacon and a token of that forgiveness and share it upon the rest of the world, imagine the change that it makes. So tonight, as we rest on this cross, let us just ask, Father, forgive us sometimes we just don't know what we're doing. And at the same time, Father, allow us to be the forgiveness that the world needs so that they can see you. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. If I only had more time, it's a phrase that we probably all said at some point in our lives, as a student, maybe studying for an exam or a test. Maybe we're stuck in traffic on our way to an interview, right? or frantically getting a house ready and food ready for a company that's coming over for a holiday. Or maybe you said it in a more serious moment, as your, your kids step into adulthood. If only I had more time. As you just heard, a life-changing medical diagnosis. If I only had more time. What do we want with more time? What do we do with our time? Is it for us? Is it for others? Is it for God-honoring, God-glorifying purposes? In this passage that we just heard from Ruth, we see a man who's out of time. He's at the end of his life. And there's no coming back from where he is. The grains of sand in the hourglass of his life are nearly gone. He's hanging on a cross right next to Jesus. All out of time. And we see an exchange between the two thieves. 
that are being crucified with Christ. One wants Jesus to save himself and the thieves, and the other thief corrects the selfish one, saying that they are suffering the same punishment as the one that everybody calls God. They are guilty. Jesus is not. And then the thief gives a pleading prayer of mercy to the one and only Christ. He says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. A criminal doomed to die turns meekly with a true and honest, sincere heart to Jesus and requests to be remembered by him. This man has nothing. Being a thief he basically is nothing. Nothing to give, nothing to offer. No opportunity to display great gifts or great skills. No chance to live a life as a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. Unable to fulfill the Great Commission with the other followers of Christ. This man didn't even have an opportunity to partake in communion. He didn't have time to be baptized. He didn't have time to repeat a sinner's prayer. He never served in a ministry. He never traveled on a short-term mission trip. He never gave money to the church. But look at what he did with the time that he had. He knew he deserved the punishment that he was receiving. He knew he was going to die. He knew Jesus was God. He truly believed. And with the few moments of time that he had left, the few precious breaths in his lungs, he asked Jesus to save him, to remember him, because he believed Jesus would, and he believed Jesus could. These are the words that Jesus says to an unnamed and mostly unknown man. Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. So that man had no hope but divine grace, and Jesus had power over that grace. And it's ironic to think about it, but how, how fortunate was it for this criminal that he was on a cross next to Jesus? His execution could have been scheduled for a different day or a different time, but it wasn't. It was scheduled for this particular Friday afternoon. And because of that, he was able to receive the gift of eternal life. And now, not only is his story echoing throughout all of history and eternity, but his story is our story. Because we are sinners deserving of death. And if we confess with our lips and we believe in our hearts that Jesus is Lord, then, then we'll be saved. Because our story is his story, but it's with a major twist because we have time. Most of us have a lot of time. If I have the ability to see the different categories of time that I've used and wasted in my life, I would be appalled, as would many of us. We have time. Time to do what this man and many others could not do. Almost more time than we know what to do with. And so the question is, what are you going to do with the time that you have? Are you going to use your time for yourself? Are you going to use your time for others? Are you, use, going to, are you going to use your time for God, honoring God, glorifying purposes? Are you going to use your time, every breath that you have, to surrender to the one and only living God? So what are you going to do with the time that you have? It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. Similarly to Brian, we've been watching The Chosen at our home, and it has caught us as well. Um, 
I most recognize myself in Matthew. And his character um, has just in our whole family, we all kind of look at him. I love the Gospel of Luke. I've taken a deep dive over this past month and absolutely love it. And it's known to be the Gospel of the Outcasts. And when you look at Matthew, you see that. You see him accepting who the church would not. When I was younger, about 20, I was working at the rescue mission in the Joy House. And there I was working with women and children. And I looked really young. I looked like I was 15. And so whenever I would come in, people generally would see me and think I was one of the kids I was working with. And so um, every Monday, um, we, would, we would meet new people. Um, our new guests would come in. And they would think I was one of them. And so Monday was also spaghetti night. And it was my night to be um, helping with dinner. So I would have my nice clothes on so that you would think that I was not 15 and actually I was important. Here I was. And so, of course, spaghetti being messy means little fingers are messy. And so I would have little kids running up to me and I would step back because I didn't want to get my clothes dirty. It would happen, I mean, I worked there for five years and one day it just hit. It felt like the Lord was speaking right into me saying, Jackie, stop it. This isn't about your clothes. This is about you not wanting to be dirty by the people you're serving. And the unique and ironic part about all of this is that when I was a child, I was homeless and I was one of them. If we look at what Jesus did, handing over his spirit, handing over who he is to the Lord, that moment, in that moment, huge, right? An earthquake, curtain tears. The centurion who is next to him sees what is happening and he praises God. He's handing it over. And I wonder with myself, what would have happened in that moment when the Lord spoke to me? What would have happened if I would not have gone further like he was asking me to? And I did. I repented. I confessed. And through that, something amazing and beautiful happened. Um, about three or four years ago, um, I got this Facebook message from someone, and they said one of the children that I had worked with had come back um, and talked to them, and they said, do you know where Miss Jackie is? And they went on to tell the story of everything that had happened while I had worked there and how I had ministered to them. And I think, had I not surrendered, had I not given over who I was to the Lord, that little girl would not have had that sort of acceptance and love that she felt by Jesus. And my encouragement tonight is, let's give it over. Let's just give it all over to him. And I don't know where you're at, and I don't know the people in your life, but let's just give it over. Let's see what will happen. And when Craig said, and just totally got me when he said, like, what are we going to do with our time? Let's give it all to him. Let's try to keep the dirty people away. Let's not do that. Let's try to have them come in. And so that's my encouragement. Let's just give it to him. Now let's pray. Father God, I praise you and thank you that we can be here tonight. And I pray, Father God, that we would be able to see what you did, that we could pause, and we could follow your example, Father, just giving it all to you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So on the cross, we see Jesus forgive. We see Jesus welcome. And we see Jesus surrender. In those three words, those are the three actions associated with what he says. 
And we are not Jesus. We will never be. And sometimes when we look at the story of the cross and we reflect on it, it can seem so distant from us as though, yeah, I, I could never do that. Because of what Jesus has done, we, we don't have to go through what he did. But the point of the story isn't to separate Jesus from us, but it's to call us into it. Meaning, we are called to be people who do the same thing that Jesus does. That's the whole point of his ministry. That's the whole point of the gospel. And so on the cross, Jesus sets an example for us. An example to forgive. An example to welcome the outcast. And the example to surrender all that we have. And as we surrender, we receive. It's counterintuitive, but so much of the kingdom is. that As we surrender all that we have, we receive. And the thing that we receive is salvation. The thing that we receive is the kingdom. The thing that we receive is forgiveness. And it's only when we are recipients of forgiveness that we have the power to forgive like Jesus. To step into the lives of those who hurt us, who have wronged us, who have offended us, and say to you, I set you free in the same way that I have been set free. And when we do that, it gives us the power to live a countercultural life, to use our time, our resources, our energy, all that we have to minister to those in need. So before we end tonight, we're going to go before the Lord's table because it's in this simple meal that we not only remember what Jesus has done, but we enter into his death by taking the elements, by eating them. The communion meal engages all our senses and it reminds us that we too are to follow Jesus all the way to forgiveness, all the way to welcoming the outcast, all the way to surrendering everything that we have. And so in just a moment, the ushers are going to come forward. They're going to dismiss you row by row, and we invite you to come before the Lord's table. We invite you to come up the center aisle. We have four stations up here. They're all the same. We invite you to take two cups. You'll see there's two cups stacked on top of each other, one with a little piece of bread, one with juice. There's also prepackaged elements at each station if you need. And then to return to your seat through the side aisle. And then once everybody has their elements, I'll come back up and lead us in taking them together. But this is a moment to remember and to reflect and to ask God, where are you calling me into this story when it comes to extending the forgiveness that I have received, when it comes to welcoming in the outcast and the stranger in the same way that I have been welcomed. And God, where are you calling me to surrender and commit myself to you? So I'm going to pray, and then our ushers will come up and dismiss you to come up to the communion table. Lord, we pray in this moment that we would be able to recognize how it is you are at work in our lives. How through the cross you still minister to us today. And that as we follow you to the point of surrendering everything to you, that we would know that you are with us, that you are for us. And may it encourage us and empower us to give all that we have to you. Amen.